Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to welcome over 120 of you to join us on today's call. Uh, great to have you all here. Thank you very much for joining us for today's uh, Seneca webinar uh, on the subject of gamifying language teaching. Uh, and I can assure you, uh, you're, in for a, you're in for a treat today. Um, my name is Jonathan Viner. I work with Seneca on their marketing activity and on these webinars. Uh, and delighted to be joined by my colleague too, uh, and also by our expert teacher, uh, Sean Beatty. Um, a brief bit of bio there about him, a uh, Japanese language teacher uh, across Columbia's, uh, the District of Columbia's uh, public schools uh, with 20 plus years of language teaching experience. But um, I will leave him to do his introduction uh, in full a little bit later. Just briefly on Seneca before we get underway, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, Seneca is a Finnish uh, educational technology company and our focus, our specialism is in providing language teaching solutions. Uh, established in 1961, which means that 2021 is obviously a, a significant and special year for us. Um, our mission is very simple. Um, we are about helping people like Sean to teach uh, and helping students to learn their languages, uh, their chosen target language, more efficiently and more effectively. Uh, and uh, as is evidenced by the people signing up for today's webinar, um, we have customers, uh, we have resellers, we have partners um, in over 110 countries globally, and our solutions, both uh, physical and, uh, and online, uh, are now in use in over 50,000 classrooms worldwide. So. Um, we're delighted, therefore, to bring together uh, and to share best practice from the classroom with our audience, with our community uh, of language educators. Uh, and again, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to Sean, who will uh, begin by uh, doubtless explaining his outfit, by introducing himself, uh, and by giving you uh, a great introduction into how he uses gamify techniques um, to bring language learning to life. Sean, over to you, and uh, we'll be back for... Hi, gozaimasu. Uh, having seen my screen, uh, I'm Beatty Sensei. I've taught Japanese for going 18 years and taught English in Japan, done lots of things. I'm dressed like this because if you can't have fun at work, uh, you're doing it wrong. And kids like it when you, they learn more about you. As teachers, we all come from a very different walks of life. These things before you that I'll just briefly go over, um, well, you can read. Um, are for my 20 truths and a lie I do every year with my students so they can learn that I'm not just a guy who stands in front and gives them homework. I try to make it en engaging and fun. Uh, I'm going to skip the slide, uh, but I was on the Discovery Channel. I was, I'm in the IMDb database for two different things. I think I have a third one coming. I do lots of interesting things and that keeps it fresh. All right, gaming. Um, my email's at the bottom, my Instagram. I use games, I'm a huge Renaissance nerd. I do all kinds of games, card games, board games, but games, the case for games, all of us are gamers. And some people are like, no, I don't, I don't play Sony, PlayStation, I don't play video games. If you use coupons, if you collect points on your credit card, you are a gamer. You're trying to find out the two for one deal. Or if I buy, shop at this restaurant, I get five times points on my, my whatever credit card I use. So we're all gamers, it's just different degrees of gaming. Um, as you know, if you have any middle schoolers or high schoolers, or maybe small kids of your own, Fortnite, hugely successful. Kids love games. This proves it. Um, although a slightly short, old graphic by two years, you can see the line here goes way up for video games into $150 billion for video games. Kids like games. If you can find ways to engage them in a game, either digitally or on paper, games are huge and why not leverage their interest in our classrooms? So they internalize motivation. Kids don't give up on video games. You've never seen a kid like quit a video game. What they do is they go online to YouTube, find a cheat code, talk to a friend, which is the same thing you can leverage in your classroom with games. Instead of just quitting, they'll like ask a friend, they'll look at the notes, doing the exact same thing. Games. For autonomy, we have Minecraft. Meaning, World of Warcraft, lots of collaboration in that game for those who know it. Uh, competency, Tetris, how good are you at making things fit? How does that translate? 
Autonomy is controllability. Kids can work at their own pace. Competency, well, competency is only change. Relationships equals meaning. The more relationships they build, they can make the language learning relevant to their life. That helps with retention and learning, and it makes it more fun and enjoyable for everybody, not just the students, but me as the teacher. Um, classcraft is one thing I'm talking about today. Uh, I've been trying to glamour class, uh, gamify my classroom for years, and for two years I tried it doing my own system, didn't work. This is a prepackaged system that has everything you need to make your class the next level of gamification. So inside the game, it's basically a skin. If you don't know what a skin is, it's cosmetics to make something look better. So I take what would be homework or points, participation points, I make it experience points. This doesn't affect the grade whatsoever, but I can give them 100 XP points for being online or they submit homework on, on time, 200 experience points. That doesn't affect their grade whatsoever. It's the actual assignment, but it motivates them. Um, in this day and age of COVID, you know, letting kid, adult know if you're sick, 200 XP, doing a good job with social distancing, 125 XP, all these little things motivate them intrinsically and it's a little bit extrinsically as well, but it doesn't affect their grade, but it helps them level up. And we're all about the leveling up. Um, the way the game is set up, you have several classes. You have warriors, healers, and mages. You put your students in teams, and they can work together in boss battles and get experience points by working together. Again, just to motivate the students. A boss battle is a basically in-class group quiz or group review activity. But instead of saying review activity, you say boss battle. There's a monster. You create the questions. It's a lot of fun. Um, there's powers they can earn. They can get the ability to listen to their iPod during work time, or maybe eat during class, or turn in an assignment a day late. These are all powers they can earn by leveling up. How do you level up? By getting experience points. How do you get experience points? By collaborating with your classmates and doing your homework. It is super customizable. I talked about skins a little bit. Kids love skins. If you have any children at home, you know what I'm talking about. They'll play video games. This is a basic skin right here, kind of plain. Then this is an upgraded, this is level 15, all the clothes, they have pets in the game, they can buy new outfits and new hats and new equipment, and kids love skins. That gives them more ownership and motivates them more because they'll see, they wanna see what the next outfit is. It does nothing in regards to the actual game. They don't get more experience points. It doesn't make them more powerful. They just look really good. So I've been using Classcraft for going five years now. It's great. This really helps. They also release seasonal skins for Christmas and Halloween. Quests, these are, this is awesome. Quests basically looks like this. You lay out a map and I'm gonna pop out of this really quick and show you mine. You, you set up the quest, you have the beginning and you have different routes they can take to get to the end. A quest actually, let's see, I'll click on this. Oh, the link didn't work. There we go. So this is a quest. This is what is this script? There's a story. Classcraft has fortunately uh, created a whole, I have like 18 or 19 stories and little like story arcs that you can just plug and play. I started using Classcraft before they had their stories already made. So I've written up really cheesy stories, which is kind of awkwardly embarrassing. So you get a story and then the task is what you're having them do. So my explanations are here. I can embed links. I can put video links, all kinds of things in here. And then I attached their homework and reference sheets, the settings. I can make it a self-paced activity. I can enable assignments. I can give them XP for assignments. I can give them a bonus for turning it in early. I can enable a class discussion feature. So that's how I run my class. And it's been great during the pandemic because it's a little more interesting than just going to a, a Zoom meeting and talking back and forth. Then we have kudos. This is a new feature from this past year and I've been really bad at implementing it, but students can write compliments to each other. Like, thanks for help the other day. Thanks for explaining that to me. And it helps build community in the classroom. It's a great tool. Uh, you might think they won't do it, but actually they do, partly because it's a nice thing to do and probably because they do get a little bit of experience point and a little bit of gold pieces to buy their outfits. So again, it's one more way to kind of motivate them. And it pops up when they log in on this big wall. You can like highlight certain kudos and kids appreciate being appreciated just like we appreciate when students say nice things about us. Bunch of research. This presentation will be shared with you later so you can spend time looking at this. There's 
some more links about Classcraft here. Again, later, come back to the presentation. We'll be sharing this with you. Le read at your leisure. It's a great resource. Don't be intimidated. It's very user friendly. It's almost too user friendly because the super nerds like me would really want to get in and change some things, but they won't let us. Probably smart. All right. The second thing that really helped this year is, again, super nerd. I do lots of card games and board games in my classes. And being virtual for the first semester and hybrid for, wait, I guess, the first, yeah, first semester and then hybrid for the next quarter and then back full and seat fourth quarter. So it's a crazy year. This has been a great website. I will be using this next year, even when we're fully back in seat, because it allows you to make uh, a tool that allows you to make card games, board games of all shapes and sizes. And the best part, it's free. I'm a teacher, your teachers, free is always good. It works just like GimKit or Quizlet Live or Kahoot or Quizzes, where you have a little, little code, they go to the website, insert the code, and they join the game. Same thing. And in the long run, it's time saving because if you've done any activities in class where you have cards or pieces and these, all right, pick up, time to go, you always find one or two pieces somewhere scattered in the corner of the room and you have no idea where those pieces go. Now it's all virtual, you can't lose them. So the pros of this, of this website, and I'm gonna show you some in a second, you're only limited by your imagination. I've gotten more creative using this site as the year progressed and as I figured out more things I could do. Super easy to share, copy, and modify. Sonico does the same thing, more of that in a little bit. Game files, once you create the game, you can download it to your computer and save it for future use. Um, the site has been constantly updated. I actually used this site a few years ago and it was very clunky and I didn't really care for it. So I stopped using it and then I came back to it this year. Phenomenal, way better. Um, it's easy to use and easy to to be used and used, whoops, made a typo there. Um, it's not that hard to figure out, it takes a little bit of time. Did I mention it's free? Because free is always nice. And again, you'll never lose game bits. There are a few cons with any technology. Uh, there's a bit of a learning curve when learning how to use it. it, took me some time. But the pro is once you take an activity, that I'm gonna share some of my mind with yours, take my activity, look at it, go into the back end, look how you edit it, and then you can make activities of my activity so you don't have to recreate the wheel. So by all means, find an activity you like, just change it. Games are kept, if you sign in with your Google, they keep all your games active for 30 days. And that is great, except what if you use it during unit one and don't come back to it next year? Not a problem. You can download it to your computer. Super useful. The next year, just upload it back up to the site. Now they can use it again. Um, Last one is you might have to create and share multiple room codes because if you share one code, you might have 20 kids in one room with a game for four people. Uh, you can create multiple rooms or do what I did. I taught my students how to download the file and then upload it themselves. I teach high school, so that was very doable. Um, what kind of games can you make? I'm gonna show you just a few of the games. These are all the games the site comes with. And I don't know a lot of these, some I do. There's a lot of games and you can look at these like matchup could easily be a matching game if you changed it. Um, I'm gonna show you two that I, these are all links that you can look, click on later and look at. Um, one is a board game. It's, it's got a board, we have spinners, you can deal the cards. And for my students, I had them to use the one, two of, of this verb. And there we go, put that over there. They'd move their five spaces. Rules are down at the bottom. Uh, that's one activity you could do. Um, dicey conversations, if you're big on speaking and answering. Oops, that is the wrong link. Oh no. I got flipped somehow. Well, that's not good. Oh, well, we'll roll through. I'll show you different one instead. Uh, this is a team building activity, good for English speakers. It's read the instructions and you place the cards to create the, the map of the town. So if you read through the instructions, um, it'll tell you the farm, there's two, level, two farm is, you know, next to another farm by the river. There's a lot of cards. You can go through them all. So there's lots of things you can do with this website, only limited by your imagination. And if I was to do this in Japanese, I usually use this at the beginning of the school year, to like build their teams up a little bit. I would just change the Japanese and maybe like I put all the names of the places in Japanese just so students would see it. Not that they'll ever use some of these words, but they might. And then 
I even include a video here how to upload a file to the site. So if you have students, you want to show them how to upload it or you want to learn how to upload it, super easy. It's like a two minute video. All right. Oh, Sonico. Sonico and playing cards at IO work really well together. And I'll tell you why. Love Sonico. There's so much you can do with it. So what's great about Sonico Connect is it's pretty intuitive. You see over here the content, I want to add a link, a text, text box for instructions. I'll record a little audio bit for the students to listen to, and I'm going to embed a YouTube video. And then I click over here, it just adds it up, and you can drag and drop all the uh, activities and bits around to suit your needs. It is very easy to use. They're very responsive to feedback. I know I've sent lots of suggestions their way, like, hey, is this a feature you're thinking about? And most of the times, like, yes, we're working on it. So they're really on top of it. It's gotten better, and it keeps getting better. And they have excellent support. So responsive feedback, if you have any questions, I know our sales rep, if we have a question like, how do I do this? They get back to you uh, with help right away. They're pretty quick on that. So you're not waiting long to get help. And that is very appreciative, especially when you're trying to figure out something brand new. Um, I see what you can do, and I have done. I have done things like reading and answering questions, inserting your voice into a video, which I, I'm gonna show you that in a second. It's kind of awkward, a little embarrassing. Um, but I had a video for my students to get to know me at the very beginning of the school year where I made a video and they insert their answers to it. Recording pair conversations. So that one I'm gonna show you last, but I'm gonna show you the activity. Oh, where'd it go? Uh, wait, oh, uh, sorry, pardon me. There we go, I think I'm sharing the screen. So I had, ins introduce yourself to Sensei. This is an actual activity I've used with my students. And sorry, I'm going fast. So much to talk about. I want to take your questions. Um, start the activity. Students click voice insert and they watch me. Can you hear my voice? No. Oh, no. There's no volume. I don't know why. But then I would stop and they would insert their voice into the activity and they'd answer my questions. Like I have questions like, hi, my name is this, Sean Beatty. What is your name? And they insert their voice and they stop it. And then their voice is inserted right there. And it's fantastic. Um, so it's a great way to introduce yourself or use video. If you had language prompts, like in your language, like what did you do? What is your name? They can insert their voices. It's a lot more interactive. They have to listen to the question. It's great exposure to the language as well. Oh, this one. This one is great. So Sonico, I did a lot of my activities are presentations and using and like project based. So this project was visiting a friend. In a normal school year, I'd use my classroom door, then walk into the house and talk to each other. And I'd sit there and record them my iPhone and grade them. This one I couldn't do this year because of the world status. So what I did is I created a house. And in this house, I had them so that they'd do all the things they did in the classroom. So they'd walk in, say, you know, and this person, hi, and they'd be, oh, thanks. And I'm like, hello, hello, come in. And he'd come in, they'd take off their slippers by flipping this card over, and they'd go into the kitchen, and this person would give them a gift, and they'd talk about the person, open the gift, and talk about this old ratty toy. And then they would go to the kitchen and bring back food. and. We did all this virtually, and that the whole time I recorded it using Sonico, so it was fantastic. And you can embed this link into the Sonico activity, so you can just click on it and go right to it. So it was really fantastic. Wow, I went really fast. I apologized. Um, so heading back here. You can do a lot, as you saw from the, the Create Your Own Activity, reading out loud, oral answers. They have a really, really slick close activities. You put the paragraph in, highlight, click close. It takes the word out and puts a blank in there. That's an awesome one. Uh, multiple choice answers, long written answers. You can embed videos, web pages, oral feedback. When you're going through activities, you can click on the feedback recorder and record oral feedback to students instead of typing it all in. Um, Paired conversations, which I do tons of, which is like the home visit. We do a telephone conversation. Um, some of the activities I've done traditionally in the classroom, I've taken them to Sonico because it saves time 
doing pair conversations in a large class, you have most of the class not, well, in my case, I put them outside the classroom because it's less awkward because no one likes to have like 20 students watch you and your partner do an activity. So I put them in the hallway to do activities. With Sonico, I can do them all at once, which saves a lot of time. Um, also, while they're playing games, if you want to get a little peek into what they're doing, you can easily have them log into Sonico and play one of the card games or board games and listen for what kind of language they're using, just do like a quick spot check for formative assessment. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's really what can you think about all the things you want to do, and you can probably do it on Sonico. Last but not least, huh, 20, 2021 was a crazy school year for all of us, I'm sure. Um, Sonico was great, Classcraft was great, Playing Cards was great. I found lots of websites, some I used a lot, some I used a little, some I saved to look at later because they were interesting, but I didn't want to try to learn something new. I try to pick one or two things a year and, and not get overwhelmed. So I will be sharing this with you as well. This is all the activities I found that are just either Japanese related or just good teaching or good activities. Some, like I said, some are useful for other languages, others are not. And that is my presentation in a nutshell. I apologize for the speed. I wish I had two hours with all of you. Um, but you have my email and I would gladly respond or set up another meeting at some point just to help you guys out. Sean, thank you for giving such a fantastic presentation in such a short amount of time. I didn't ever imagine that you would be done quite so quickly. So thank you for thank you for doing such a great job. That's amazing. And I would like to allow lots of talking, like question time, because we definitely need to talk. Okay. So uh, we have some questions in the Q&A Q already. If you've got a question for Sean, uh, please do just keep dropping them into the Q&A. And uh, as I say, I will uh, feed them to him as we, as we go. Sean, just uh, a question from me, I guess, just to, to kind of start the ball rolling. Yeah. You, you've obviously been doing this for a while. You're hugely experienced. You're hugely passionate, hugely knowledgeable about your, your craft. Well, but I, I guess I imagine lots of people will be sitting on this call going, he makes it look so easy. There's no way I could ever do that. People who are starting out at the beginning, you are a sensei, I guess. You will have novices uh, who are thinking, where on earth do I start? What would be the kind of two or three things you would say to a novice thinking about kind of listening to your presentation and thinking, Right, where do I start? What would be the two or three things you would you would kind of get them to do and, and get them to start with? First one, start. Just do it. If you avoid it, it's never, never going to get better. Two, start simple. Like, and don't get too complex. And allow yourself grace to make mistakes because, yeah, I've got some cool stuff now. I've had some real stinker activities where I thought, this is brilliant. This is going to be so great. And then I do it in class and it totally crashes and explodes and doesn't go well. And I just laugh at my students like, okay, that was a really horrible rule for this game. Or this is just a, it sounded great when I thought it through, but I didn't think about this other thing. We'll do something different. So I've had to change things in the middle of an activity because I thought it was going to be a good idea and it wasn't. So just do it. Start simple. Start with games you know. Board games are easy. Those are really easy. Uh, for if you're using playing cards to IO, Ma take a matching game, do a matching activity. English and what pictures or Spanish and English or whatever you're using. Um, if it's Sonico, start with a pair conversation. Don't get crazy. Keep it real simple. Maybe start with my little video introduction that I did last year. Just start really simple and then like, ah, you know, that was good, but what can I add to that to make it a little more interesting or challenging? And you slowly start building this repertoire of things that are really interesting. Oh, and the last thing is try to limit the variety. Find things you can use the same activity for multiple grammar points or whatever. That way it saves you time as a teacher. And how do you, how do you think your approach will be different in kind of face-to-face -face teaching? Obviously what you've talked about, what you've described here, you can immediately see how they would work delivered online, delivered when you're not face-to-face. -face. How will it be different when you're all in the same classroom, do you think? And how will you change your approach? It won't change a lot because I've been using Classcraft as organizing my curriculum up until recently, up until like last five years. So that'll stay. 
Um, Sonico, we used we used to, we have a physical lab that I think we're switching to Sonico Connect because it's easier. We save time not walking down to the lab, so that's not really going to change. Might be able to do some more activities because they just put their headset in, they can record in the classroom so much faster. And PlayingCars.io is so awesome. You have no idea how many students have lost one card from a game, or I find things around the classroom that you can do just like Kahoot or Quizlet. And you'll never lose pieces ever again. And I can make a million card games and board games and I can think, oh, I need to add this new vocab word. I can just go in really quickly and add it before the game starts. It's, or even in the middle of a game, it's great. And I guess we probably all can see instinctively the link between gamification and student motivation. But just give us an example of, of a student who his learning of Japanese, I guess, has been transformed by this, by this approach. Why does it work and how did it work for a particular student? I had a student who did all the extra activities that I offered because they wanted to level up and get to level 18, which is the highest you can get to. They wanted to get there. So they would do more work and extra optional activities that would get them some points, but more importantly, experience points that would help them love love faster so for them those kids get like, oh yeah, I want to be the kid with all the skins. Or I want to be the highest level in class. So that little kind of competition, it's not really a competition, but it is. And they want to be the kid with all the cool toys. You've been very uh, discreet and referred to a student and they or them. Does this, does the gamification approach work equally well with boys and girls? Or are there, are there things you need to bear in mind to come up with games and activities that, that appeal equally to both sexes? Um, I think for the most part they appeal to both sexes, generally speaking. I mean, obviously there's people who are more into gaming and want the skins. I've had students who, you know, it, it, for, for Classcraft, you have to really work these levels. But if you just put take Classcraft out of it, just board games, everyone loves board games, everyone loves card games. Nobody likes worksheets, although sometimes necessary, right? I'd rather have an activity where I can work with my group and play a game because in any group setting, there's always that one or two kids that are really, really good. And one or me at one kid is really struggling and some kid in the middle and they have that discussion and that's how you learn anything. I do the same thing at my place of work when I'm trying to figure stuff out. I'm sure all of us as teachers have said, hey, I have this idea, can you help me figure this out? And we work with each other and learn together. So that's with the actual games. I've had no problems. All kids like games. Okay. There's some games they don't, some games they don't like, but I can't, that's always the case. Some activities, some kids love, other kids hate the exact sure. same activity. Okay, let's have a look at uh, some of the questions uh, that we've had in already. So uh, we have a question from Antonio asking whether this approach could be used for college classes. You're obviously a high school practitioner, but how might they need to be adapted? What other considerations might be needed uh, to use this in, in college classes? I think it'd work at any level, honestly. People like games. I mean, think of the thousands of hours probably most of us have wasted on our phones playing a silly game. Like, kids like games. It's better. The interaction is what we, I mean, especially foreign language is a team sport. Speaking any language, we don't, it's like tennis. You don't play tennis alone. You play tennis with a partner at the minimum. It's probably more like soccer or American football because you have to talk to each other on a team. In a language classroom, I can't just sit there and learn the verbs and memorize the stuff and be a competent speaker. I have to actually learn the verbs, which is like the moves and the, and the plays, and then I have to play with the other people in the class, just like tennis. So yeah. I, I think it would be great. I think it'd be a nice shift because I know there's a disconnect between high school and college language, how it's taught. So you get the college is very formal. Okay. And I'm kind of, so I think it'd be great if you're fresh, fresh, fresh air. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Nessa, that answers your question uh, as well, I think. Uh, um, one question that we have, been, there, there were a few kind of practical questions, John, which we're just, we're, which we're just kind of going through now. Um, our uh, question here um, about whether the games are mobile friendly, uh, and, and I guess linked to that question for me is, are kids using doing these games on mobiles or are they using them on laptops or desktops and does it does it matter does it make any difference i have not actually tried playing cars to io on mobile because all our students have one-to-one -one laptops 
Although if you have a web browser on your phone, I think it would work. Okay. Although it'd be really, really small. So that might be the <laughs> downside. I mean, that's the only downside I can think of, but I think it would work. And your laptops are provided by the school district, presumably. They're, they're, they're not bringing your own devices from, from, from the kids themselves. Correct. Right. Some students do prefer bringing their own laptops, but most kids use the, the school laptops. And I guess linked to that, what happens if a child doesn't, uh, I mean, they might have a laptop. What if they don't have 5G? What if they don't have good Wi-Fi connection at home? How, 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 how accessible, what, what do you do in those circumstances? Um, mostly, well, for 20, most of my kids, I had their cameras off during the during all class because that would suck up their bandwidth. So I almost didn't see my most of my students first semester. There's just little boxes with their names on it. Um, so try to limit what other things they're doing. So no video for anyone in class. Um, the games themselves don't take a lot of bandwidth because they're not graphics intensive. But you can still do Quizlet, you can do Kahoot, you can do playing cards to IO because once it's loaded up, it's not much in the way of moving parts so it yeah. works just fine uh, you mentioned that playing cards to io i think was free can yes. uh sanico uh connect is paid for but we uh will offer a, a free trial at the end of this uh session uh, is classcraft free a, a few people have asked there's a free there's a free version and there's a pay version i think the pay version yeah i, I think the price might have gone up recently i think it's around 80 dollars but it's, there's also a free version, so you can kind of sample it. The nice thing about Classcraft also, which I didn't talk about, is there's a lesson plan marketplace, and if you have a paid subscription for the year, you can go look for, say, Day of the Dead in Spanish, and there's people who've already made lessons and shared them, so you can just download them and use them, okay. which is very nice. Uh, Gabriella has asked a question. If you could choose just three apps slash websites to use, which ones would you choose? I suspect you might find this quite a difficult one to narrow it down, but have, it, ha have a go. Ooh, wow. Not the three I've talked about? Yeah, <laughs> you, you, we, we, we know those three. Give us another three. three. I would say uh, I like GimKit. GimKit's really good. If you haven't seen that one, that's on my digital resource page. GimKit, Quizlet, and... Ooh, one more, huh? There's several I haven't looked at yet. Mm, it's the t probably quiz is. Just spell that for us. It's Q U I Z I Z Z, I believe. Okay. And but and that's a similar kind of Quizlet Kahoot kind of. Right. They're all just thing. a little bit different. They all. Do wish okay. All the same. Yeah. Um, now I know you're a, a, a Japanese teacher. Somebody's asked a question about uh, has asked a question about maths. Uh, I mean, do you think this approach could be transferred to to other subjects, to other uh, to other courses? And, and I oh, guess absolutely. if yes, have you have you any experience of doing so? Uh, yes, actually, let me pull up. Um, I, I'm still sharing my screen. Yes, yep. I have. I presented this before last year at a conference. I can show you some quests that I imported that are not my subject. I have Dio de los Muertos, uh, let's see, a French one that someone made about food. There's math, there's social studies, there's all kinds of things that, let's go to the marketplace. Where's the marketplace? My library, uh, I can't find this. Uh, but but there's it, so many. So okay, many. that's great. Sean, actually somebody has asked if you could stop sharing your screen so uh, uh, so they, that they can, they, they, they can see you in full. There you go. Oh. Yeah, but there's sub every subject you can think of. There's science, biology, math. All these would work with Classcraft. Okay. All it is, it's a skin. You're just presenting it in a new way. It's just saying quiz or homework. It's a task. It's a quest. A, a couple of link questions here from uh, Sarah Frost and Maria Hope. And Sarah, I'm glad you enjoyed uh, Sean's presentation. Um, Sarah asks, uh, I'll give you both questions, but I think they are linked. So Sarah asks, do you have any thoughts about limiting how much in-person class time should, should be spent using online tools or with younger learners? And then Maria's question is about kind of how you might handle or if you've ever had objections either from parents or from students about learning through digital games. 
No, I have. Well, I, I don't think it's a problem because the board games, like playing cards, oh, you're still playing with a group of people. It's not, it's not just online on an app and no one's talking sure. to you. So you're, you're still engaged with people. So I'd argue it's actually better. It's better than what the kids usually do, which is watch YouTube or do all these games on their own. I've never had pushback, and I've actually had students who enjoy it because they get to talk and play games at the same time. The 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 game is just on the the, the phone. Yeah, it's not, the, the learning's taking place in, in real life. Even on Zoom, even over Zoom, it's still you're doing the activities with people. And do you limit uh, to Sarah's question about limiting time? Do you limit the amount of time that you might spend online, or might I spend a whole lesson learning a particular grammatical conjecture through through online gaming with you? Oh, we wouldn't spend the whole lesson just doing online gaming. We have I break it up about three activities. It's so weird. Last last year we did lots of group work and group activities. So we would do a pair of conversations, which is just talking. No, on, I was online because of the necessity. But in, in the classroom, we'd stand up and talk. And then traditionally, I would use maybe a board game with dice and playing pieces. Now I have playing cards that I owe. So it, I don't think I'd really limit it. I haven't really thought about it to be honest. Because I'm always doing three or four things at every class. We have block yeah. classes of in, in 90 minutes. So, Sandra uh, Aguilera asked a question about, um, I guess, the balance of activities that are synchronous and asynchronous. How, how, how does that work for you? And what changes do you need to make to your approach to, to deliver that? Uh, asynchronous, Quizlet's good for that. GimKit is good for that. You can assign activities on those platforms, which is fantastic. And then synchronous is usually like, you know, either team versus team or sometimes it's who's the best player so there's lots of different activities you can do in class so you can maybe do it sign it as homework and then in class see who's the best so you can kind of break it up that way okay um you mentioned then about group based uh claudia asks a question here uh asking are these she says is it all group based or can you also use these approaches for individual tutoring oh yeah i, I uh, I, absolutely. I don't see why you couldn't. Uh, the only the only disadvantage of that for Classcraft is it's designed for group work, but you still could use it. Absolutely. GimKit, uh, you can assign homework, which is individually based. Uh, Quizlet, same thing. You can do all kinds of things as individuals or teams, either or. And it's always great on these sessions when uh, colleagues share their best practice and their thoughts. So uh, Kathleen says that quizzes is amazing, so it backs up your uh, your feedback. Uh, Liliana recommends a bluecat.com, Educandy, and Wordwall. Do you know? Do you know those? Would you recommend any of those? Bluecat is on my 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 digital activity grid. Wordwall, I don't know. And what was the other one? Educandy. Educandy. No, I don't. I'm gonna write that down. I'll look at that later. Say. Well, you've got you've got uh, even the uh, even the sensei is picking uh, something else. Oh yeah. Picking up new ideas. Um. Uh, Alexander asked the question about will there be a recording for the webinar? The answer is yes, and that will be sent around to everybody uh, who registered and who participated. Uh, apologies if there's an issue with uh, the sound quality on my mic. We had a couple of technical difficulties to resolve just before we started. Um, uh, there's a question uh, from uh, Rosangela, who asks, do you think these games are good for students who need accommodate uh, accommodations, brackets, IEPs? I would think you, yes, because they can work at their own pace. There's certain things you have to focus on. You could create a Quizlet set or a game kit or something that they could work on. I know in my high school, the autistic students love Dungeons and Dragons. I don't get a lot of them in my class, but this like class cap is right up their alley. That's They'll probably complain it's not geeky enough. Like, I should have a power-up <laughs> because I have all the armor. But I think for some, absolutely. I think you really hone in on certain skills. Um, I guess the question linked to this, um, you've talked in, in broad terms that kids love games, therefore um, right. this would work brilliantly. What if kids don't like games? Uh, don't like games? Um, now I've asked the question, how would you deal with students that weren't res kind of responding to this type of, of teaching or, or, or approach? Well, uh, games by their very nature push social interaction, which is speaking and listening and all that things. So, I mean, if you don't like it, a worksheet does not replace having a board game and talking to people in the target language. So I would just encourage them, 
it's like if it's like if you said, all right, we're not playing a game. We're just gonna sit down and talk about this thing. That's one way to do it. Or we can play a board game. And I suppose they. I just kind of show them the comparison, and they're really the same thing. Just that one has a fun factor. But they're they're. It's either I assign it. You sit down. We talk. Or you talk with their partner. Or we can play a board game, and you can talk to your partner. So yeah. I just kind of show them that it's not it's not different. It's the same thing, and I, and they might not play to win. They might not even care about winning, which is fine. I usually tell them it's not about winning. It's about the practice. So you might not like this game. I'm sorry, but it's really not about winning. It's about practicing and trying to have fun, and maybe winning. <laughs> uh, there's a question. Another question about PlayingCards.io. Uh, uh, Daniel asks, is it an iPad app that children can join to? No, there's no app. It's a website. It's a website. Okay, so it's all done through the browser. Yep, and you could you could create the rooms in advance and then just put a link on a, a, a class page. Just click on that and they'd go there. Like, you know, students, this group goes to room one, room two, room three, room four, and they can just go there and do it. Um, and linked to that, Maria has just asked a question about how do I make language cards in playingcards.io. I don't know whether it's easy to answer that quickly before we... Or, although uh, that's a, a longer answer, or should she email you for a... A quick guide. Uh, um, well, let me. Uh, well, I can sh let me share my screen just really quick. I can give you a quick show of what you can do, and, th and then I'll I'll leave it at that. Uh, so, uh, there we go. So, click on the back end, edit table. Click on the cards, edit deck, and then you go to cards, and you just. It sounds like a lot, but once you play with it, I just change that, and you're done. It's it's. It's a lot of going to the back end. It's not as hard. So that's why I said find a template of an activity you like. And I shared several of mine. Look how I made it. And then go through and put the, the words in that you want. Replace the pictures. It'll be much easier than trying to do it on your own. Um, OK. Uh, we've got a couple more questions here. Sandra says that she loves the idea of using Santa Co Connect's voice insert in order for students to introduce themselves. Uh, so that's great to hear. Um, Kathleen asks the question, have you ever created a digital escape room? No, I haven't. But flippity.net uh, com. Flippity does some great stuff where they have like a little breakout room, like you can have questions and unlock things and get out. I've not. I've heard of digital breakout rooms. They sound amazing. I don't know if my brain can make one. <laughs> I, I'm sure it's your brain's probably pretty flexible and could probably do it. And I guess one final question um, from Dia. Um, uh, Dear's question is, um, have you any idea how to teach English vocabulary to be more attractive? I guess you've done, you've given quite a few ideas here. Um, but I guess about vocab specifically, how can you make vocab interesting and engaging rather than just, here's a list of words, go away and learn them? Um, so depending on the vocab, I use a lot of Battleship, and that's a very American game. So picture two columns, like usually it's letters and numbers yep. but instead i'll put like colors and nouns it's like do you have a blue coat and then yes i have a blue coat so you put vocab they're studying like verbs and nouns or adjective and you have them ask questions and answer in full sentences like do you have a red jacket no i do not have a red jacket which a no would be a negative answer so it's a miss or yes i have a red jacket in which case it's a hit okay so i repetition uh Annabelle says uh, genial.ly is brilliant for escape games. If you Another one for you to add to your list, Sean. There. I will add that. Fantastic. Uh, okay. I think that uh, we are a couple of minutes over time, but that's uh, we've had lots of great questions. So thank you, everybody, for your questions. Thank you for your feedback uh that you've been uh adding into uh into the q a it's brilliant thank you adrian and sandra and there are a few of feedback there that's wonderful to see uh i'm glad that you found it useful and uh valuable and enjoyable